thank you, Jesus, that you are a living hope. Let us just sit in that thought for a moment. You are a living hope. Our hope is alive because you are alive and you are alive in us. you enough. We can't glorify you enough for you are worthy of it all and more. So let us just remember that throughout the day that it is a living hope that we are alive in him and he is alive in us. us never get dull to that fact. I know on this weekend, we tend to dig in a little deeper. We tend to feel a little more of the weight of the cross but that's how we should be every day. We should feel the weight of the cross every day and we should feel the grace that was poured out on us as well. Let us not walk deeper for one week or one weekend. Let us continually walk deeper. for the King of Kings is alive and he sacrificed himself for us. So we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, welcome. How many of you are still like chewing on one or all of Bob Sorge's messages. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to listen again. <laughs> probably like six or seven times yes. before I, yeah. You, yeah, you take it all in. Yep. Ooh, powerful. Yes. And, and we get to follow that up. <laughs> I'm like, how, I, I asked Pastor Rick, I'm like, how do you follow up three messages of Bob Sorge and not look like a complete idiot? So, Yeah. I know, right? It's like, that's what I was thinking. Oh, man. Feeling really good yeah. right now. <laughs> so, and, and he said, he said, I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, well, at least we'll lower the bar for the young adults. Yeah. <laughs> so back tomorrow, down. Yeah. We'll be back up with So, Rick. Yeah, yeah, with Pastor Rick, it'll be up there good again. But we're like, cool. Yes. That, was, that was probably the best three messages, consecutive messages I've ever heard. Yes. Oh, like punch it because we'll uh, for those that weren't able to make it Thursday or didn't hear his Thursday message we'll post that message all about loyalty it's amazing so we got like a punch in a face Wednesday punch in a face Thursday punch in a face Friday and it wasn't it was just that yeah, yeah right who doesn't like that yeah and it wasn't just I don't think the punch in the face sometimes it was it was just the the awe of it yeah. all too yeah and I was like whoa you know you, you yeah. don't think about certain things that way yeah and so it does, it helps us gain perspective yeah. for sure. And I, and I think that's because 
I mean, the Holy Spirit is speaking through him. And For sure. Like the Bible says, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not going to, you'll see but won't perceive, yeah. you'll hear but you won't understand. Yeah. So yeah. I think that was, whew. Yeah. yeah, very good. We tried to get him to uh, stay one more day yeah. and do this, <laughs> you know, do young adults, yeah. but Thomas he failed. He was going to go, yeah. Thomas was going to go out and try and convince him. Yeah. <laughs> no. It didn't work. It didn't work. <laughs> I know. Yeah. He was funny, too. He goes, yeah. I just need to know what my budget is. <laughs> He's like, I convinced somebody. I just need to the know what my budget is. sales guy. Yes. What's my budget? Yeah. I'm like, it was awesome. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. We tried, though, because yeah, yeah. no. we love you guys. Yeah. But uh, he, he wanted to get home for his family for, yeah, Easter, for Easter. So, you know, yeah. how can you blame him? He'll be back, though. We will absolutely have him oh. back to speak. So, yep, we'll give you the heads up. Maybe next time we'll try to say, hey, just stay a little later on Saturday and come speak to the young adults. Yes. So we'll aim for that. He does like speaking to young adults. He specifically was asking for time with you guys on that Thursday. And oh, he loved, yeah. like, he was not kidding. He loved seeing all the young adults, like, right up there, yeah. right up front. He was like, ah. Yeah. So. Um, and before we get started, there's a birthday on Tuesday. Oh, yes. Too bad I don't have a spotlight, and I could be like, pew, Alexandra's Alex. birthday is on <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> er it's when? When is it? I was going to say, I know when his birthday was. It was not. We just had it like a month and a half ago. Nice try. This is what happens when Jean sits next to yes. you. Just note to self, don't yes. let Jean sit next to you. When she's in the back, it's not as bad because you guys don't hear her. She's right here now, and so it's like, oh, yeah. no. it's awesome. Yeah. 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 Um, so for this message, though, I want to encourage you guys that maybe, you know, get out a journal, um, get a pen. I feel like God wants to speak to people today, and I think it's going to take, it might take you, you know, if you're the one, if you're one that needs to be not next to people in order to really concentrate, that's fine. You can sit. It is true. I need, that I, is true. That's why I wear <laughs> But you can't take this, so, you know. That's true. You need to, you need to stay here. Um, but I do feel like God does want to talk to us today and um, speak to us through this message. Um, do I tell him the title? Yeah, wait, we'll, wait, before we do oh, that, okay. just because I, I was thinking about this, and I talked to a few people, and so I want to put it out there, but because I think part of it will it'll actually play into this. Last week when I said that, that whatever that line that you read was stupid, the the uh, white American oh yeah yeah uh, I'm like evangelical Christians <laughs> like everything is through the lens of yes. nationalists yeah. and uh, white supremacy white supremacy yeah. and it was after I was so like just in the moment like irritated with it I couldn't get out the words that I, I wanted but I, the reason why that was stupid was <laughs> the, the, the better reason Pardon. why it was stupid <laughs> Nail that in there. was they, <laughs> and it's even more stupid now, like even, <laughs> now that I can articulate it a little more. But what they did is they described it, but then they defined it their own way. So basically what they were saying is like if you are American and white, evangelical Christian, all your views are basically were because you're nationalistic and white supremacist. The problem is they get to define what that means. Okay, so what they're saying is if you're a white American, then if you're not ashamed of being American, you're a nationalist. Yeah. If you're not ashamed of being white, you're a white supremacist. Mm -hmm. So they get to define by their own terms, and that's not truth. Yeah. And, and I think this is going, today's message is actually going to speak to that too because it, yeah. it deals with conviction yeah. and grace, which are God's truth. So yes. that's, you have to be careful when people set it up and they get to define their own terms, what it means. Yeah. You know. And they're subtle. It's like the yes. commercials where, yeah, I don't know if any of you have taken college courses where you have to like really look at commercials and understand subtly what they're trying yeah. to say. When you take the time to do that, you're like, oh my gosh. But because we just glance through things and we don't take, we don't take pause and I think that that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. Today. And we have to be careful as Christians not yeah. to do the same thing. Because yes. a lot of times we like to read the Bible and define it ourselves, what yeah. it means. Mm. What, that's true. So. so today we're going to talk about the weight of conviction and the release of grace. So right now, I don't, I, I'm assuming that you would agree with me that we live in a society where there's no waiting. Everything is instant. I would say most of you have no idea what it means to have delayed gratification. 
<laughs> when, I, when I was a kid and I took pictures, which I love pictures. Pictures are my thing. And I would take pictures. I, I took a picture. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe that turned out. I have no idea. But when the film comes back, I get to see. And it would take weeks. You know, but I would wait. Like, I found this one place that would do it quicker in the mail, and I'd mail it, and I'd be checking that mailbox every day. But that developed this delayed gratification in me, this, this ability to wait with joy. But that, that has gone away in our society. Yeah, we've replaced it with waiting with anxiety. Yes, that is true. Yep. So we often run to instant grace. We don't pause to actually understand what we've been forgiven of. We don't pause to actually allow ourselves to feel the weight of conviction. I think that's one of the biggest causes for things like progressive Christianity. They start to feel the weight of conviction. It's like, oh, no, uh, hey, the Bible actually means this. I want to run to the grace. I want to run to God's love instead of actually going, no. His word says this, and I should feel the heaviness of that for a moment so I can understand what he did on the cross, so I can understand that release of grace, right? And the Bible says those that have been forgiven much love much. Do you want to love much? Then you need to understand you've been forgiven much. Luke 7.47 says this. This is when... um, the woman was coming and and pouring perfume over Jesus, and it was a year's worth of wages, right? And And he says, therefore, I tell you, many, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. That's why she's pouring out extravagant love to me. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. How many of you would acknowledge that you've been forgiven a lot? Right? So if we've been forgiven a lot, if we forget how much we've been forgiven, doesn't that mean that then our love, our ability to love becomes minimal? And this is where the the defining terms a bit plays in the the progressive Christianity because they're defining love as accepting everything. Yes. And and the Bible says that love is truth. It's telling somebody the truth, that it's going to harm them or hurt them. It's not you know, good for them. Mm -hmm. And then they talk about like grace just being a license to do everything as well. So we have to make sure that we're not defining terms on our own desires, but what God desires and what God's truth is. And so when you look up the word conviction, because I looked it up, I I, I started going through a message. I didn't define define something last week, so (laughs) here we go. (laughs) But I, I, I like it. It says the state of being convinced, obviously, but it's the act of convincing a person of error or of compelling the omission of a truth. The state of being convinced of error error, or compelled to admit the truth. Mm. So when we are being convicted by God, are we actually letting God convince us of his truth and our mm. error? Or are we just going, oh, I, I did something wrong, because mm-hmm. that's what he said. He just said it's wrong, but, it's, but I'm not really understanding mm-hmm. his truth. Yeah. Am I not sitting in it long enough to understand that before I go out and then go, okay, well, he's forgiven me. Because we've talked about that a lot in Conquer, where if you stumble, you're forgiven. But like, you also need to let the weight of that conviction sit for a little bit. Otherwise, we just go, okay, well, I stumbled, no problem. I stumbled, no problem. And we just allow the addiction to continue or Mm -hmm. the sin to continue. Yeah. Well, and if you think about that too, when you're convinced of something and when you feel, you feel something, right? When you have that conviction, when you are compelled by truth, there's an emotion that comes along with it. And we're going to walk through Christ's journey that he took from the garden through to the cross into the resurrection. Because at each step, we want to show you the emotions that he was going through for you. Because it'll help you to feel that conviction. It'll allow you to feel the conviction. And I want to encourage you, keep the arrow pointed this way. Because when we talk about things, feelings especially, the tendency becomes, oh yeah, that person made me feel that. Or oh yeah, that person, and you want to point to other people. Or oh, they should be listening to this message. Right? (laughs) Anyone? (laughs) No. I've never done that. (laughs) But that's, that's our flesh and the enemy wanting to, to, again, not bear the weight of conviction. 
our flesh wants to resist conviction. So we have to say, no, I, I need to feel that. So keep the arrow, keep the finger pointed at yourself during anything that we bring up. It's okay to have a blip of like, oh yeah, that, I got hurt there. But try not to put a name on it. Try not to put people's name on it. So we tend to focus on our own pain, right? Or what others have done to us more than stopping to understand our own sin and our own flaws and what we're doing. Rick Renner put it this way, I love this sentence, how tragic it would be if we lost sight of the pain and the price of redemption. That is a tragedy. So we're gonna walk through that t today. We're gonna go through like a high level view and trust me, we couldn't do it all because I, I kept going. He's like, you've got a lot here. I'm like, I know Jesus did a lot at every step, and I'm like, I could read, Rick Renner in April does, does from the beginning all the way to the cross, and it's a daily devotional of two to three pages each day of breaking down Greek words, and I'm like, can I just sit up here and read like 30 pages worth of notes from him, because they're amazing, and that's kind of where I was going, but I can't do that, it would well, be way too long. And this whole part of the painful journey, we look at it, right, we don't want to deal with it, but like, like Bob said, it's not a tomb, it's a womb. It's a That's womb, right. Right? Yes. It, he's trying to birth something through you. It's not a setback, it's a setup. Yes. You know, so I, I love how we do need to embrace that aspect yes. of it. Yes. Otherwise, we're going to miss the point of it yes. as well, too. And when there is a womb, when there's a baby being developed, there is pain. It's not just pain and everything's childbirth. That's the pain. There's pain all during it. There's sleepless nights. There's elbows up in your ribs there's the lack of being able to breathe there's we got 18 year old 14 year old 13 I mean, they're, they're still <laughs> painful let me tell you it's not going away they're not even away. in the womb anymore yeah. <laughs> right. yeah now it's like they're not in the womb but they're in the room <laughs> and it's like oh. <laughs> we love them <laughs> clearly or, yes. they're, or they're texting from the other room <laughs> or that calling from happen. the other room are you in yeah. the house Yes, no, but I don't no, want no. to get out of the bed. Yeah. No, 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 I'm not. <laughs> Still at the church. <laughs> yes, it's midnight. Um, <laughs> so we're going to start in the garden because we could start, again, we could start before that, but the garden is such a significant place in what Jesus did for us. So at each step along this journey, I'm going to ask you your pain and to kind of bring out what pain you may have felt that Jesus also felt. And then we're going to end with, okay, but in that moment, what is your flaw? And what is the thing that you need to reflect on? So in the garden, your pain, have you ever felt the pain of loneliness? Because in that garden, Jesus felt alone. He felt without friends. The scripture actually says that he was in agony. Luke twenty two forty four 44 says this, being in anguish, he prayed more fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. And I read that and I go, yep, and in that moment, his friends treated his pain casually, like it was insignificant. So our flaw, or your flaw, how many times has Jesus asked to engage with you, to have communion with you through prayer? saying, I need you to fervently pray for your friend. They're about to walk into hell. I need you to fervently pray for revival. I need you to join with me in this battle. And how many times have we casually just said, eh, it's not that significant. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, And we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, Comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Pray constantly. Colossians 4.2 says, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but I know I don't always stay alert in prayer. Next we go move on to the betrayal. So he's exhausted from praying it says an angel came and strengthened him, but the verse that I just read to you about him sweating blood, that was after the angel came to, to strengthen him. So in, your, in pain, have you ever felt betrayed by a friend? Judas spent three years with Jesus and was 
in charge of all the money that they collected. Have you ever had a close friend of years or decades even that you felt the sting of betrayal? As I was studying this, I, I realized or I felt like God revealed what Judas's main problem was. It was submission. He was in charge of the money. I think that is so significant. It's why we talk to you guys so much about tithing. Because if you don't submit everything in your life, the enemy has a hook. Listen what it says, John 12, 5 through 6. This was earlier. So Judas is already in charge of the money and everything. And he's complaining because someone broke the uh, perfume over Jesus. He says, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Listen what it reveals. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. If we don't surrender and submit everything to the Lord, the enemy will have a foothold. In the garden when he betrayed Jesus, when he came to identify the Lord, he, he identified him with a kiss. You talk about a complete slap in the face of betrayal. It wasn't like, you know, stand far away and say, hey, that's the guy. But he wanted to be up close and personal and, and like put the knife in his back by doing it with a kiss. And even in that moment, he didn't, he didn't cry out, oh, Lord, and give him a kiss. He said, master, master. That meant teacher. So a teacher is still at an arm's length, right? There's not that intimacy. There is in the sense that you're, you're being taught by someone. But just because someone's teaching doesn't mean you're receiving. Had he said, Lord, it would have shown his full submission to someone in authority over him. Teachers said, mm, no, I'm not submitted to you as my ruler. So, what is your flaw? Have you ever betrayed the Lord through your lack of submission to him? And that's submitting in everything. Like what Bob said yesterday. I want my body. I want my soul. I want my mind. I want my time. I want my talents. I want my giftings. I want my treasure. Everything submitted to the Lord. So what are you still holding on to? Because I've said it before, without God's grace, any one of us can be Judas. Because it says that the enemy entered him because of these things, like the enemy could come in. So the capture, have you ever felt weak? I'm using the word felt on purpose because we have the Holy Spirit in us Feeling weak is it's just that. It's a feeling. We are strong because of him. Jesus prayed and came out and probably physically felt the weakest he's, he had ever felt on earth. He, cry, he was crying and weeping to the point of bleed, or just crying out in bleeding blood or uh, sweating blood. I guarantee you he felt weak. Spiritually, emotionally, all of it. He walks out, gets stabbed in the back by a friend. There are 300 to 600 specially trained soldiers coming to get him. So it wasn't like a small group of people. They were, they were weaponized with the high-tech weapons. This is the Navy SEAL team coming to get Jesus, probably because they had heard the things that he was capable of doing. But I love this transaction. John 18, 4 through 6 says this, Then Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went out and said to them, Who is it that you're seeking? Can you imagine? I picture him. like It's not like he was Goliath. He was a normal-sized man, you know, probably strong, but just standing there with this massive army in front of him. Who, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. I am he, Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. When Jesus told them, I am he, they stepped back 
they stepped back and fell to the ground. <laughs> we can read that and think, oh, they stepped back and oh, like they tripped over a rock. That's actually not what happened. The step back is the stumbling, but the fell to the ground, the translation in the Greek actually means that they fell so hard that they, it fell like they were dead. And to the ground means it was abrupt and they hit the ground. All he said was, I am he, and 300 to 600 soldiers went slam. Can you imagine that sound with all their armor and weaponry? I, I often think of that and go, it, that's who's in you. That Jesus who said, I am he, and knocked 600 soldiers like that on their butt, that's who lives in you. So our flaw, your flaw, how many times do we forget to acknowledge the I am in us? So the trial. Have you ever been falsely accused? Felt the sting of shame? Have you ever been ashamed of Jesus? The shame that he faced, I think none of us could even understand. They spit on him. Rick Renner puts it this way. He said, by the time Caiaphas and his scribes and elders, again, a massive number of people, we think that it's just a group, it, it was a large group of people. It says, by the time they had finished taking their turns spitting on Jesus, their spit was most likely dripping down from his forehead into his eyes, dribbling down his nose, his cheekbones, and his chin, and even oozing down onto his clothes. Not only did every single one of those people spit on him and, and humiliate him, because that was the lowest form of disgrace, was to spit in someone's face. So he had all of them do that, and then he was also beaten violently. They would all punch him as they were going by as well. The scourging that he went through for us. Roman scourging in that day, it says this, that often the spine would get exposed, bowels would spill out of their body, they would have such an extreme loss of blood and bodily fluid that it would cause low blood pressure, excruciating thirst because of how much fluid is leaving, to the point of fainting and becoming in shock. Then he was mocked, being called king of the Jews, but Rick Renner said this, his love for them and for you was unwavering. Unshaken and unaffected by their wrong actions. So how many times has your love been conditional on someone else's actions? Another betrayal happened. He was denied. Anyone ever feel not supported by a friend or denied by a friend? First he lost his friend Judas and then Peter denied him. Were you ever that one that didn't want to associate with someone for fear of what, they would, what it would do to your reputation or what someone might say? Has your walk with Jesus ever put you in an unpopular position with your peers? Put your job at risk? Put your status with your friends at risk, your family? Did you choose to sacrifice your job and your friendship or your status? Or did you sacrifice your commitment to the Lord? Then you look at the walk he took. The Via Dolorosa. Your pain in that? Life is heavy and hard. We're called to carry the cross. I read earlier, God calls us not to be idle. We need to stand up and carry the cross that he has given us. 
1 Peter 2, 21 says this, for you are called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. Like Jason said a couple weeks ago about the narrow pathway, the narrow path isn't a road. It's stepping in the footsteps of Jesus. That's including his suffering, his carrying of the cross. That was, I was listening to a podcast the other day, I can't remember who, and they were talking about how the word straight in that isn't the, you know, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, it's the S-T-R-A-I-T, which for that meant that it wasn't, it wasn't just like straight linear, but it's more of a crushing straightness Mm -hmm. that as you get go down that path you feel like you're getting things are enclosing and you're getting squeezed down to get through yeah you know to you basically have to minimize yourself in order to get through it and then at the other side is that freedom yeah with it yep so our flaw in that part of the journey how often do we think that our life needs to be perfect and without pain have you ever said why me i can't the number of things Bob said this week that I just went, oh my goodness, mind blown. (laughs) Like moving the Israelites into Egypt so that they would survive and that they would expand and grow. I'm like, never, ever did I think of that. So whatever pain and season you're in, there's a purpose. So the cross... Your pain, have you ever felt like your flesh is crying out? But the cross, I put three, three words for the cross. For first is sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Two, their suffering. Second Timothy 3.12 says, In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Yay! Such a joyful verse. <laughs> but again, it's okay to feel the weight of that. And then the third one is separation. Jesus suffered separation from God. As as Bob said, God died for you. So our flaw, your flaw, in this part of the journey, how often have you decided, no, I don't want to kill my flesh in that. It's okay if my flesh reigns here. Or, oh, I just, that takes a lot of work. I love what Rick said last Sunday. I said it was one of my favorite lines, and it it was short, but I went, that is so true. He said, your flesh is noisy. Your flesh is noisy, but you have the power to quiet it. You just have to be louder than it. After he died on the cross, it says that he was in darkness for three days. You ever feel alone in that, the dark night that we've talked about? Where is God? What's happening? just that that darkness that can happen John 8 12 says this Jesus spoke to them again I am the light of the world anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness but will have the light of life so our flaw in that part of the journey is that we we forget if, that if we keep following Jesus his light is going to shine but we get absorbed and focused on the darkness Again, rather than than the I am that is within us. So after all the weight of the conviction, the weight and seeing the pain that he suffered for us, and again, we're just scratching the surface. There's so much more that we could talk about. But we get to rejoice in what what he ultimately did for us because it brought grace. It brought him saying, you don't need to feel that weight anymore. Let me lift that off of you because I took that on the cross. 
I took that with that whip that scourged my body and ripped my skin off. I took that one, that one spit on me. So in that grace, here are some of the things, again, I can't list them all. We have forgiveness. Psalm 32, 1 says, How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Guess whose sin is covered here? Anyone and everyone. If you've said yes to Jesus, your sin is covered. Anything that popped into your head when I was talking about your flaw and, and, and there was a reminder of that weight, it's forgiven. Colossians 1.14 says this, In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It doesn't say the forgiveness of some sins. Any sin. The forgiveness of sins, period. If, it's out, if you have done something outside the will of God and have grieved him, you're forgiven. You need to repent. That's where the forgiveness comes from. Through his grace, you have strength. 2 Timothy 2.1 says, You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Grace isn't some delicate, like, oh, it's like, it's this flower, and I'm forgiven, and yay, light and fluffy. I think that's how we see it sometimes, because of the relief that it gives us, right? The relief of conviction. There's power in grace. We need to be, remind ourselves the, the grace of God is full of power. That's the next one, power. You have power because of the grace he bestows us. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says this, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. How often do you rejoice in your weaknesses? I know I'm not good at that. He gives us peace through his grace. I'm going to read you Hebrews 12, 14, but I kept the title of that section. You know how your Bible has titles for the sections, you know, godly living and a holy living sacrifice. The title of this section, warning against rejecting God's grace. And he says, pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. God gives you faith and love through his grace. 1 Timothy 1, 14 through 15 says this, And the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. Through his journey, he gave us the Holy Spirit, his counselor. Without all of that pain, and even without the grace afterwards of his resurrection, if he didn't go, the counselor wouldn't have come. So what a gift that was. And I think all these <clears throat> kind of allude to, if you don't have a right view of conviction, you're not going to have a right view of grace. If you don't have a right view of God, you will be disappointed by him. And you don't think that's true, look at Palm Sunday. So he comes right in on Palm Sunday, and people are, are you know, screaming and shouting, Hosanna to the highest. And then what, on Thursday, they're saying, crucify him. Same people. Mm-hmm. So they went from loving him to wanting to kill him. Did Jesus change during that time? He came in, he, he healed in the temple, he spoke truth. Nothing changed about him. Mm -hmm. People changed. Yeah. Our perception of him changed. Because they thought he was going to be this earthly king, and he goes, oh, I have much more for you than just this. Yeah. Right? So if you don't have a right view of God, you will be disappointed by him. If you don't have a right view of yourself, you will be disappointed by people mm. constantly. Yeah. So if you don't have a right view of your sin, your flaws, your errors, then you will always dis be disappointed by others because you won't or you will refuse 
to see how you hurt, abandon, betray, and you're not perfect yourself. Mm -hmm. When you don't see the sin in your life and how it affects others, you will never be able to love those who sin against you. Mm, that's good. You will accept grace but never give it out. If you were here last night or watched it online, Bob Sorge said, we need to view everything through the lens of the cross. So if you don't view yourself through the cross, and by that I mean we look at what was needed to be done to be redeemed, then you will think what Christ did on the cross was for the world as a whole and not personally for you. Mm. When you don't take ownership for your part of the resurrection, you won't take ownership in loving and giving out grace to others in the way that Jesus did. In other words, if you don't take ownership for what you did to put him on the cross, you're not going to then take ownership in loving and giving out grace to others. Jen already read 1 Peter 2.22, but I'm going to read the NJD version of it. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, <laughs> leaving you as an example for you to follow in his footsteps. Yes, <laughs> but I, I love that, and I never, until he pointed that verse out, if you weren't here on Friday, watch the, watch the, watch no, the service, don't. yes, but um, it says, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, so are you following in his steps when it comes to the conviction of sin, and remember, Jesus in Gethsemane in Matthew said, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. He said that because he felt the weight of God's truth. Mm, yeah. And that was that he needed to die in order for us to live. Right? So remember, conviction is the state of being convinced of error or compelled to admit the truth. So if we aren't following in his steps of conviction, if we aren't feeling the weight of God's truth, how are you ever going to follow in his steps in giving out grace? So we want to spend, I, I think I want to spend at least like five to ten minutes. I'm going to have them put music on. I want you to spread out and just allow the Lord to talk to you and, and give you that weight of conviction, give you that reminder of the things that, that you've done. It's Again, I don't know about you, but I've easily said, oh, my gosh, if I was there, I would have been supporting him. I, I would never have denied him like Peter did. I would, you know, oh, I would have been Mary at the cross, just, a, you know, weeping. Would I have? I don't know. Nor do you. So we have to pretend, I, I kind of dare you, pretend that you're the, the soldier nailing the nails in the, his hands. Pretend you're Caiaphas spitting on his face and punching him. Or you're one of the Roman soldiers with the whip. Because if he did that all for us, for our sins, we have to acknowledge those sins. We have to let them sink in, one, so we don't do them anymore, so that we truly repent. Anyone ever do those soft repentances? Oh, yeah, about that. I won't do that again. <laughs> it's like that dance. He wants you to turn aggressively from them. But we can't turn aggressively from them if we don't feel the weight of them. We do the soft repentance because we don't let it sink in. Let it sink in. It's okay. Because the joy of his resurrection is the release of grace. That release of grace is going to feel even more powerful when you let it sink in deeper. When you were talking about, like, we don't, we don't repent. We don't repent. We ask for forgiveness. Ooh. It's a big difference. Right? Our girls do that. Oh, I'm sorry. For what? That you got caught or that you did it in the first place? Or that you knew you shouldn't have done it and you did it anyways? Yep. Like there's a whole different level of, of what we're going through. Most of us live up here in the, the forgiveness because it's on the surface. It's easy. We don't have to do much. Oh, sorry. Oh, Jesus, I shouldn't have done that. Sorry. Mm. What about Jesus? Obviously, there's something wrong in my heart still. Help me find out what that is so yeah. that I can turn from it. Yeah. Right? As yeah. we get deeper. And, let, and like Jen said, let that weight crush you a little bit. But then 
ask for the grace. Feel the grace because otherwise the enemy yeah. will use it yep. and you will then walk in shame. Yep. And that's not the goal either. Yep. Right? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, people reign in either one yep. zone or the other most of the time. They either live in this, I, I feel conviction, but they don't receive the grace. And, and I would say too, the, the level of conviction that you allow the Lord to put on you, yep. allow the the freeness of grace at the same level be the same level yep. or more Agreed. because it is it's so much more yes with it and so even though your conviction in here may bring you to tears those tears should actually become tears of joy yes right and not not that crushing i'm i'm a horrible person we all we all know we're not perfect yep. but if we were horrible people he wouldn't have went through all that for us it's his abundant love for us. So receive the love at the end of it. When we start this worship song, come into the worship song ready to receive the abundant grace and love that he wants to pour out for each one of you. Okay? I want to pray for you before you go into that. And again, you can spread out. You can come up front. You, whatever works for you, that's great. So, Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you so much for how you sent your son to die for us. And even as I say that, Lord, I, I say it because it's the Christian thing to say. Like, we've said it so often. Thank you for dying for us. So, Lord, help us to feel the weight of what that really means. Thank you for the agony that you felt in the garden, Lord. Thank you for the loneliness that you felt. Thank you for going through humiliation and shame for us. Thank you for being spit on for us. For being violently beaten for us. Thank you for every stripe that you took for our sins, Lord God. That ripped flesh off of your bones. Thank you for carrying your cross for us. Thank you for hanging on that cross for us. Help us in this moment, Lord, to truly feel the weight that what we have done and what we will ever do has been taken on that cross, has been taken by you by those beatings. Let us feel the weight of that in this moment. But at the end, Lord God, I ask for your Holy Spirit to pour out an abundance of grace that we would feel the release of your grace over us. That shame would not be carried here. For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Speak to each one of us, Lord God. Fill us with your spirit. Show us your love and your mercy and grace in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
we cry out holy because you are holy. And there's nothing more else that we could cry out to you. Because that says it all. And we thank you, Jesus, for the work that you did on the cross almost 2,000 years ago. And we still cry out holy, holy, holy. Lord, and we will cry that out until there are no more wind in our lungs. And then we will cry it out for eternity with you. We thank you, Lord, for doing things that we could never do. We thank you for letting the weight of God's conviction rest on you that you needed to die for us to live. And we thank you and cry out, holy, holy, holy. Father, I just pray for everyone here today, Lord, that they would allow the conviction of your truth rest on them to truly understand it because there is a difference from hearing something and understanding it. So let us understand that conviction so that we can truly understand the gift of grace and the power behind it. We thank you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> all right. Well, just a reminder, next Saturday is our worship night. Yeah, 7 p.m. <laughs> Invite people, whoever you want. Um, and we will see you, oh, no, before we go. Um, we have a couple people that are being sent out as sheep among the wolves, and our um, Lord is moving through them. So we wanted to pray for them before they left to just pray for protection, pray that God would continue to move through them, and that uh, many people would be saved. So Ivy, Andrew, and then Jordan and Kenzie, surprisingly, are joining us today too, and they are starting there. All of them are starting their DTS training at YOM and everything, and they'll be going on for, going off for the next, what, six months to to preach the word of the gospel and the conviction of the cross. So come on down here, guys, and we're going to pray. And then um, anybody else who wants to come down here and pray over them, we're going to lay hands on them and pray. Come on down. Yeah, they're coming. They're coming down here. Yep. They had to make sure somebody was watching the baby. They can't just, they just can't up and run off. So yes. It's right over here. Yeah, bring him over here. Let him get in here with the. Excellent. There you go. Oh, it's all me. Great. I'm going to get out of the way. Oh, I should have come up here to begin with. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Oh, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to fall on them, Lord. Your Holy Spirit to guide them, Father. That you would reveal to them and open their eyes like never before, Lord God. To your mercy, to your grace, to your power, to your love, Lord God. As they step out in faith, Lord God, I ask that you would strengthen them. That you would make clear every step, Lord God. I rebuke the enemy right now from the spirit of doubt right now in the name of Jesus. There is no doubt that is allowed here. I rebuke the spirit of anxiety right now in the name of Jesus. It must be removed right now in the name of Jesus. I speak no anxiety. I speak your peace and your comfort right now, Father God. Guidance. If you have a prayer, feel free to pray it. Lift him up. I ask Jesus that you would prepare the path right now, wherever they end up being assigned, Lord God, that a path would be already being dug out for them, Father God, that you would be softening the hearts of the people that they're going to be witnessing to, Lord God, that, that they would have favor amongst those people, that they would um, be seen as 
true Christians bringing the light of Jesus Christ into those communities, Lord God, that your miraculous powers would be seen, Lord God. Lord, I ask that you would carve out time for them as they study and grow and learn that you would remind them to continue to carve out intimate, personal prayer time. that you would whisper to them and speak to them at every turn, Lord God. That they would not walk in fear because you gave them a spirit that is full of power and of love and of a sound mind. So there is no spirit of fear here. Father, as their feet grow weary on their journey, Lord, I ask straighten them with that cross, that cross that's like in their spine, embedded in them, Lord. Yes. Father, I ask that your footprints before them just are illuminated, that they know that as they're walking forward, that they're stepping into your footprints, that they're following your path so closely, Lord, that they yes, feel protected, yes. that they feel safe in your guidance, Lord, that they feel your light and your love around them always, that there is yes. protection just surrounding them so fiercely that they don't even know, they don't even know what's ahead and they don't even worry or fear or care because they know that you've gone before them, that you are before them, that your steps are so already embedded that your plan for them is to just grow them and strengthen them in your love and in your light and to spread your love to others, Lord, that they see that and they feel that as every step that they step is so brightly stepped before them that they're able to just walk forward in confidence, in courage, in strength in your knowledge and in your wisdom, Lord. We just thank you. We thank you that you are so powerfully strong. We thank you that you have them in your hands, Lord, yes. that they are right there holding on to you and clinging on to you. And whenever anything comes against them, Lord, that we bind that in the name of yes. Jesus yes. and that that cross is strong. It's stronger than anything else, Lord, that it is their spine. It is their arms. It is their means to move forward, Lord, with your love and your strength, and your courage. They lean into you, and you alone, Lord, are the one that can guide them. And they hear only your voice. They see only your plan, and nothing else, Lord. In Jesus' name. Can I just agree and declare over you that you guys are ready. You are ready. That's what the Lord says. You are ready. You are ready to build his kingdom. You are ready for all that he has for you. And the enemy is the one that's not ready. The spirit of intimidation is the one that's not ready. But you are ready. And I just release you in the name of Jesus to step into that courage and to step into that boldness by the power of the Holy Spirit. I decree and declare breakthrough that your lives will never be the same. That, yeah, just new history. Even your families will never be the same. God, I thank you for the breakthrough that will be brought even to their families as a result of their obedience to you, God. I thank you for the salvation, for the fruit, for the encounters. Lord, I just bless them with your peace. I bless them with your strength. I bless them to yes, encounter Lord. your yes, love Lord. unlike ever before, yes, God, that they would have dreams and visions yes. unlike ever before. Yes. I just yes, release God. them to step into the fullness of their destiny in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. As we send them out <clears throat> as sheep among the wolves and we lift them up in prayer, I want to challenge each and every one of you. They don't need prayer just for today. For the next six months, they're going to need prayer as they go out into another country, a new territory. The attack that will come from the enemy because they are doing God's will will come. So I, I challenge each and every one of you. Remember Andrew, Ivy, Jordan, Kenzie in your prayers for the, at least the next six months. Continue to lift them up as they go out and do God's work, God's will, spreading the love of Jesus wherever they go. We thank you. We thank you for your service, Lord, and reward them for their faithfulness. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.